When the Bible talks about laying out of hands, what does it mean? There are different views about it. The problem is we don't have a actually clear definition or command about laying on of hands. When we think about it, we see laying on of hands used in various different ways. We see it regarding someone being healed. We see it when it regards someone being maybe a transfer or succession of office. We see it as it relates to someone receiving the Holy Spirit. The problem is, though, we see it used sometimes and then not sometimes. We see Jesus laying hands on someone to heal them. And then we see Jesus not laying hands on someone to heal them. In Acts, which is a transitional book, we see people receiving the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, and we see them without it with the laying on of hands. Consider a couple of different passages. In Acts 13, we're going to see people who did not receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, and then we're going to see a couple other passages where they do. So in Acts 13, 48, for example, it says, When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as heard, uh, had been, I'm sorry, had been appointed to the eternal life, believed. And so here we see people believing, hearing, and receiving. But then also we look at another passage in Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. So here we see the Holy Spirit falling upon them. And in this case, no one had hands laid upon them. However, if we go in contrast this, compare this with other passages, such as in Acts 8, then we see Acts 8, 17. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. This is Simon and John coming down to Samaria and laid hands on them. And I think that's important to see why they why they laid hands on them in this case. We'll come back to that in a second. But then also if we go back, if we go to Acts 19, and when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came to them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. These are the people who were disciples of John. They heard John preaching this baptism of repentance and that was pretty much it they needed more but they had not received the holy spirit whether these were just converts or people followers of john or they were actually his disciples we're not totally sure they may have been actual disciples of his but here we see paul physically laying hands on them now a couple things the term laying on of hands can mean something spiritual or it can just mean a generic sense. In other words, if I say I laid hands on this person to put him in prison or to kill this person or to do this, you would use that because that's, that's exactly what you're doing. You're putting your hands, you're grabbing something, you're holding something. But then it's used in a spiritual sense, really in a symbolic sense. Uh, now, some might say it's more than symbolic, but in regards to what's happening with the body, you would use it in that sense. Now, the question is, is this symbolic or is there some power to that? Well, if there's power to it, then that would have a problem because it would not explain the inconsistencies in how people, one, received the Holy Spirit, how people were healed, how succession was made. And so that would be a problem if we think that there's actual power. In other words, me putting my hands on someone and then transferring power in that way. What this seems to be is a physical confirmation of something happening. I'll give some examples in just a little bit, but there's some ambiguity when you think about how Timothy um, received power or who laid hands upon Timothy. For example, Paul speaks about him in 1 Timothy 4.14. He says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through a prophetic utterance by or with the laying on of hands by the presbyter. Now, this is in the plural. So so the laying on of hands, the tone, chiron, this is the hands of the of the body. And so it seems as though the, there was a body of elders that laid hands on him. So was it them that did so? Or uh, was this the the church? I'm sorry. Or, or was this Paul who did so? Because Paul says so in Second Timothy. He says, for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And so this is Paul's hands. And so is that Paul laid hands on him or was Paul considered part of the the uh, the group? Could be. There's a little there, there's a little confusion there. Maybe maybe they both go hand in hand. Don't know. But it could simply be that Paul is simply stating that one, he's giving some sort of succession or some sort of power or the ability to do uh, or to work in this office. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times when we see laying on of hands, it looks like there is a transfer, not necessarily of power, but of position, because there's something that we need to consider. The laying on of hands says just as much about the person who is 
doing, who is laying the hands on someone as it does the person who has had their hands laid on them. We look through the Bible and we see times where, for example, Moses laid hands on Joshua. In Deuteronomy 34, 9, now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid hands on him, uh, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So here it seems as though the purpose for this is that Joshua would now receive the same sort of authority or view by the people as they did Moses. Otherwise, how would they know? They didn't, they didn't, they wouldn't be able to see. Now, obviously, they would see power or signs happening at the sign of Joshua, but they didn't see signs at the hand of Joshua initially. And so this could be the reason why them literally physically seeing this happening. Think about it this way. If at a church there were uh, there was a new elder installed uh, or new elders, would it suffice just to have an announcement or is it conveyed even better if you actually see other elders or the pastors laying hands on physically, putting their hands on the person and praying? The message I think is sent a little bit stronger and I think that's probably what we're looking at here. So when Moses physically lays hands on Joshua, then Joshua is seen is known by the people to be taking over for Moses. Moses is getting old. And so that's what's happening. Just like in Acts 6, we see there's this complaint that arises between uh, the people in the body, the Hellenistic Jews uh, against the native Hebrews. And so what do they do? They bring for themselves disciples some people to kind of act alongside with the apostles. And look what it says. He says the statement found approval of, uh, with the whole body or the congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of, of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon. And so these people already have the Holy Spirit, so they're not actually being indwelled or, or receiving power. But notice what it says, and these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. And so now we can physically see that these people are being confirmed by these apostles as people who have some responsibility, some sort of delegation from the apostles, so people will listen to them and hear uh, their complaints on behalf of the people. So here we see an example of laying on of hands just simply being something symbolic. In other words, you giving validity, validity or approval of or to these people, you kind of granting power. Again, some sort of succession or some sort of exchange or continuity between this person to the next person. So this continuity of, el of leadership from one person to the next person seems to be one of the main ways that it's done. As a matter of fact, it's done graphically for the people to see. That's why Paul makes a statement in 1 Timothy 5.22. Now remember, these letters um, to Timothy and Titus as well have to deal with them establishing the church, uh, appointing elders. And so we see him saying to Peter, I mean to Timothy, Paul is saying, so do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of the others. Keep yourself free from sin. That's why I said earlier, it's not just about the person who's having hands laid on them, but it also says something about the person who's laying hands, who's doing it. So the person who's laying the hands and the person who's having the hands laid upon them, it says the same. And so the, the same sort of way that you would look at this person who is laying the hands is how you ought to look at the person who's receiving the hands being laid upon them. Now you think about this, is it necessary for salvation? Well, we couldn't say that because if that's the case, how many of us have actually uh, placed our faith in Christ and then had someone lay hands on us? Salvation is not because someone laid their hands on you. Positions seem to be verified because of someone's laying their hands on you. You're not where you are because they are, but people see you that way. And so when we go back to Acts 8 and we think about the people in Samaria receiving the Holy Spirit. Well, think about what's happening. We've got a new church. And by the way, the majority of this talk about laying on of hands is in Acts as well as in the letters from Paul to Timothy. So we see that the Holy Spirit has first fallen upon these Jews in Acts 2. Now, notice we don't see them having their hands laid upon them, although someone may say, well, they were baptized. The question is, well, was this a physical baptism or a spiritual baptism? If this is a spiritual baptism to the tune of over 3,000, so 3,000 people having uh, being added to the church, is this a physical baptism or a spiritual baptism? The, the, the debate is there. Uh, I'd probably lean towards a spiritual baptism. But to say that people are coming to the Lord, because someone puts their hand on them, well, then is that the way we always do it? So no. So that's why I lean towards this being a spiritual baptism. But think about this. It doesn't speak about them having their hands having or having hands laid upon them. 
So we see Jews receiving the Holy Spirit. Then in Acts 8, we see Samaritans having the Holy Spirit. How do we know that Samaritans also received the Holy Spirit? Because, again, the people that laid hands on them or give confirmation or validity are these apostles, these Jewish apostles, in this case, Peter and John. And then in Acts 10, we see uh, people receiving the Holy Spirit, in this case, Gentiles. The problem is, though, we don't see them laying hands upon them, uh, but we do know they received the Holy Spirit and the Jews that are there marveled. But then in Acts 19, we see Paul laying hands, and so we see uh, them also being counted as part of the body. And so there's still some inconsistency. So when we go to Acts, I'm sorry, Acts, we go to Hebrews 6, 2. Matter of fact, let's start in verse 1. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instructions about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and the eternal death. So this part right here, uh, laying on of hands is used here. So is this to say that we we need to lay on of hands and lay hands on who and when? Interestingly enough, there is no instructions, especially no consistent instructions about laying on of hands. And then also there is no command to lay hand on of hands. There are individual commands for one person to go lay hands on another. In other words, Ananias going to lay hands on Paul. But we don't see a command. You must lay hands on someone so who to lay hands on, when to lay hands, how to lay hands, is it one hand, two hands, under what circumstances, we don't see that command. And so you could not turn around and say that we have to do it in this way because the in this way is missing. We're not told in what way to do it, how to do it, when to do it, and to whom to do it to. So I think it's a good idea, though, especially in, in positions in the church, if there is a, a new leader being installed in the church or been brought up. I think it's very important. I think it's very good to lay hands so that the people can see that this person or these people or the body is laying hands, giving approval, giving confirmation, which again goes back to what I said. The laying on of hands says just as much about the person whose hands are being laid on as a person who is laying the hands. You are saying we give credence, we give validity, we validate this person and we're in essence staking our name on it. Ultimately, though, the power that would move this person comes from the Lord. And if it were that it had to be laid on the hands of everyone to one receive the Holy Spirit or to um, be saved or to be healed, well, then we have a problem because one, that's not consistently in the scripture. But two, that is an awful lot of laying on of hands. The number of people that have come to Christ, um, the overwhelming majority did not have someone actually touch them and lay hands on on them to say that I signify or validate that you are a Christian. Why? Because you couldn't do so. You could not validate that this person is a Christian. So me laying hands on you and saying you are a Christian, well then now one, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong and my name and reputation would be at stake. And then two, uh, it doesn't help you even though I said so. So I hope this helps. I hope this kind of gives an understanding of the laying on of hands uh, in the Bible, as a matter of fact, early in the church, we would see this done, this practice continue. It would be done sometimes, most of the times physical. There are some times it would also, it's also done kind of not with an actual physical hand, laying on of hands, but us just kind of giving um, our validation saying that these are the things that happen. And so we're laying our hands on you. Not necessarily a physical laying on of hands, but um, speaking so metaphorically, but just giving our approval. However, the most important thing is the fact that what laying on hands is and that it is not a command. Again, we cannot find a command. And so uh, if a person wants to lay hands on someone, I, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, you would do so on a case by case basis. But again, as we're told, be careful who you lay your hands on. Be, be careful who you give confirmation to or out of your mouth. Be careful who you tell someone else is approved. Be careful uh, of who lays hands on you and be careful of who you lay hands on. Amen.